Welcome to the Tech Sales Show, where we are dedicated to making you a better tech seller, sharing tried and true sales strategies and answering your questions weekly. Hey, hey, Bobby. What's up, Brian? Got another listener's choice, back-to-back listener's choices. I loved uh, the discussion last week around virtual assistants. And Bobby, this one really dovetails into it. And this is about kind of building wealth and organizing life. And this is one that uh, you and I get uh, asked about a lot around just, you know, more around the, hey, how do you manage these projects on the side and keep life in order and kind of keep somewhat of a balance? Uh, And while it's a very difficult thing uh, to do, of course, a lot of it comes down to kind of organization. So today we're going to spend some time talking about that. Perfect. I love it. Um, so the um, let's start kind of, Bobby, by talking about some projects that we're involved in today. It could be both from the family side, the professional side. So for me, my, my primary job, my number one job is with Workday. Uh, I manage a team of sellers, and, um, and they've got teams of solution consultants and enterprise architects and everything that help them get the deal closed. That is my core job. That is certainly my nine to five, and it extends on both sides of that often days. Uh, Tech Sales Lab, Tech Sales Show uh, is one that we're, of course, both involved in uh, pretty heavily. And that has ebbs and flows in terms of its uh, busyness and its schedule. But it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, coaching students. It's um, recording podcast episodes. It's a number of activities around that. Um, I own a um, roofing and outdoor living company um, called Qualis. I own it in partnership with several guys. Um, that's a growing business and something that it's uh, very fun to be a part of. Uh, I've had rental homes now for over a decade. Um, that remains my highest return on investment uh, consistently year after year after year is the rental homes. Um, part of it's just luck, kind of buying in the right place, right time. And then on the family side and personal side, for me, it's um, my kids are involved in sports uh, I've got two kids. They're both teenagers, so of course, uh, Bobby, you know that firsthand. Uh, they have busy lives, and it's fun to be a part of those. But I'm heavy in in fitness stuff, so um, you know, cycling and running and that kind of stuff, I really enjoy as well. So those are kind of I, I, I say that, Bobby, to say to kind of talk about like these are the things that I'm juggling in my own personal life, and we'll talk about like why do these things and. Secondly, if you decide to do some of these things, how do you kind of organize your life in a way that where you can um, have a healthy balance? No doubt. I think uh, I think if you take it from my like my son's perspective, he's like, "Well, you're busy, but you don't have a job anymore." That's what my son would tell me, right? Um, and in reality, I do. I, like you, the flight school is kind of my daytime, full time gig, uh, and I spend. While I only spend 20 to 25 hours a week at the flight school, I'm on the phone often. I'm dealing with things. I'm talking to people, doing a lot. And then for me, Tech Sales Lab coaching is probably a good 10 10 hours for me a week uh, that I'm dealing with it. And then podcasting is probably anywhere from an hour to two hours a week of trying to get this show ready and and putting the production together and then then putting it post-production, blah, blah, blah. And then I think for me, it, it is kind of being my son's golf manager right now. Uh, we're we're doing everything we can to help him excel at golf. That's a seven-day-a-week job. I probably put at least 30 hours a week into that with him, and that's from managing his, his tournaments to get driving in places to now just participating in his golf lessons to take him to tournaments. We spent three days, uh, I guess it's been almost 10 days ago now, or three nights, four days in College Station playing four days in a tournament. And that's just a grind that, that, that kind of sucks it out of you, right? So what I, but I think of it when I think about this episode, I think, okay, we're able to do all those things because we did a lot of the right stuff 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I think that's what a lot of this episode's going to be about is we have the flexibility to have all these extracurricular activities because we set ourselves up for success starting 20 years ago. Totally agree. Um, yeah. And I think it starts with that. Yeah. That's really where we'll jump into next really is like, you'll, if, if you're always, and I've, I've told this to my 
kids since they were young, I've told this to young professionals, if you're working for a base salary without uh, some sort of commission kicker, or if you're working off an you're you're effectively working off an hourly rate, and you'll always be a slave. You can never build wealth uh, that way. It just it won't work out for you. And the people that we're all fortunate that most most all of us are in the tech industry or have been in the tech industry and have made wealth off that. But I talk to so many people that as soon as they get that stock grant, Bobby, they're selling that stock. They're mm-hmm. you know they're they're getting their stock grant once a year that's vesting over X period of time. And they're excited about that vest date because they're cashing that stock in. Now there's nothing wrong with cashing the stock in and then, and then, uh, you know, spreading that across another portfolio somewhere, of course, if you don't want to be over, uh, invested in a single, uh, stock or invest in the company that you're working for. Um, but so many people treat that as like extra as like income, like ways to pay their mortgage because maybe they got in over their heads on their mortgage or maybe they're thinking about getting over their, head, their heads in mortgage. But stock ownership is such a key opportunity for wealth. Bobby, you and I spent several years at Sparkhound uh, building up there, you know, building the that business at Sparkhound. And, um, and in a way, that was that was stock ownership, right? No that was you. Yeah. yeah, it was you. When you opened up the Houston office and then opened up the Dallas office, in, in partnership with me, your what you bought at early on was much different than what you sold at at that future date. No doubt, and that it's it was the biggest parlay for me into what made my future. It helped me buy the flight school, helped me pay off college. I mean, there's lots of, of good that came from that. Um, but I have seen people squander some of those opportunities as well, meaning get all that money, buy a bigger home, pay more taxes on that home, buy a fancier car, and then it's gone. And then what do they do? they got to go work again. And even if they're not making an hourly wage, they're living on a number per the year, and they're trying to – they're spending all that money. Uh, And the one thing my dad told me that I don't know why I remember it, but when I was a police officer – and I wasn't quite, I was. I think I was engaged, but I wasn't married yet. He says, son, it'll never get easier. Go work another extra job today and save that money because it'll never get easier. And I believed him. I don't know why I believed him, but I believed him. My son doesn't believe anything I tell him, but I believed him. And I, I started working more extra jobs, and I started putting that money away. And, and from that date forward, I don't think I've ever had a credit card bill that I didn't pay in full um, because I knew the slippery slope that that could create for me. Yeah, no doubt. So stock ownership is key. Uh, don't touch it. Uh, put that back out for me. And in, in Workday, some of the early stock I got was in the $40 per share. We're up near $200 a share. That stuff is a, you know, a good part of the overall wealth. It's meaningful for sure. Um, and I, I think this probably goes without saying, but I, I still talk to people that this isn't an obvious one is maxing out things like the 401k IRAs, pre and post tax contributions to retirement budgets, working towards a 30% number is, is crucial. If, if you, if the goal really is to retire, uh, why not work towards that 30% number, uh, putting back, uh, every single month, month in, month out, there is nothing better than having that, that account at a value that whenever the market's up or down, you're seeing your balance go up by, you know, $10,000 per day. And so just, just so they're not, in case someone's not clear when you say 30%, that's not, you're not trying to save 30% of your income for the end goal. You're trying to save 30% a year, every year. So you can, today, I think the max on a 401k is around 15%. Um, Like I can contribute 15, depending on what my company does. They might match some or none or all, it depends. But you're saying I, after that 15%, find a way to put 15 more back in IRAs and post-tax stuff. That's exactly right. Yep. Uh, because you're you're going to have two sources, and everyone should have a financial advisor if they don't already. You're going to have two sources of income when you retire, post-tax and, and pre-tax money. And uh, if you have money that has already been taxed, um, that will work differently for you than money that is uh, that has not uh, been taxed at this point. So have have a couple of pools that you're continuing to build towards. Don't just lean on that 401k uh, because it has limits to it, of course. Well, Brian, I mean, somebody listening might say, Jesus, I'm not going to have any fun. I'm making all this money and I'm not going to have any fun. What 30% is a big, big number. What? That's crazy. 
It's, it's maybe maybe it is crazy. I think the I think what happens oftentimes is that we, and especially for those that have you that are established in tech, you've seen this time and time and time again. It's people get suckered into half million million dollar homes in this business, and with those giant homes come giant bills and giant responsibilities. And I guess my advice for people that have not already been sucked into that is if you live modestly, you can still have all that fun, do all those trips, do all the fun things that you want to do and still save 30% by not getting suckered into that giant home when you're you know, 30 years old. Yeah, and I don't want to derail us too much, and we'll talk probably more about this, but the net of it is when I was a police officer, my wife was a school teacher, we grossed about $60,000 a year. And while that was 20 years ago, that still probably is less than six figures as a combined family income. We we would today, those two jobs probably bring in just under $100,000 a year. And we had a great house. We had great vehicles. We didn't know any different. We, we saved money to buy a deck on the back of our house. We just didn't go buy it with a commission check, those sorts of things. And I think what happens is we, no matter who we are, what we are, we're going to spend whatever we take out of our checks to spend, right? So if you make $35,000 a year and you put back $9,000, you are going to live off that amount of money you save. That's 30%. If you, do it in, if, you have, if you make a million dollars a year, and you let yourself spend the full million, you're going to constantly be in this rat race. So you got to you got to set a threshold and stay there. So we're going to get out of uh, get out of your personal business here, but that was an that's an important note. When we get asked, Bobby, you know, like what is it what is it y'all are doing to like how do you how do you have so many side things going? Part of it is getting that part of the house in order. So that whenever it comes time for you to want to do some sort of uh, gig or side job or some sort of entrepreneurial venture, you have you have cash in the bank. Uh, you've got a career that's been established, and you're not in over your head. Because when you're in over your head, you make short-term decisions. And getting into entrepreneurship with a short-term mind is a recipe for failure. So let's talk about, uh, Bobby, I I took down kind of four things that I think were crucial in making entrepreneurship side ventures work. And I'll I'll start it by saying the best ideas fail all the time, all the time. Like there's there's one thing I did at at Ferrum that I thought, man, this is like, this is perfect. It's the perfect idea. It it couldn't fail. And it failed and I'm I'm better for it. because Quick spin I've, on what is Ferrum. Quick spin, what was Ferrum? Yeah, what was what Ferrum was doing was basically it was a consulting business that was outsourcing um, it, instead of hiring contra- uh, consultants to deliver the work. It was it was finding the work, selling the work, and then putting 1099 contractors on to deliver that work, or having partnerships with other service companies that could deliver that work. Um, so the model. Um, for, you know, for me and from you know anyone I talked to was like, oh my gosh, how, how you know how could that not? It's the you know you know the products inside and out. You know who, people to deliver the work really well, and this is like this is one of ten things that I've done, Bobby, over the years that have failed. So like it's just it's just it's one of many. It's it you're we're all gonna fail way more times than we're gonna succeed. And I always kind of hated hearing the. Um, the pe- people say, you know, that, um, you know, good ideas could fail because I thought like, well, oh, no, no, a well-executed idea with a good, as a good idea, that's going to succeed always. And it's just not the case. It's just not always going to work. Do you have any, Bobby, that over the years that you thought for sure would be a winner? Oh, yeah. Well, I've had some, well, yes and yes, but I've had some winners that never, never got done that got done by other people first right i mean Mm -hmm. i think that i bet we all everyone listening probably has seen an infomercial or a product at bed bath and beyond or ace hardware or something like that that said i had that idea first um and they didn't get it executed i I think i've had some of those i think i've had some of the bright ideas that just never played out um i've missed some opportunities i've said no um for sure to some ideas that probably made would have made me a small fortune as well I think the, so the key I, the key things to work through are four four areas. One is solving sales. Um, that is the that is the most difficult part of this, especially if you're selling to consumers. If you have uh, end, if it's a B2C type marketplace, 
uh, because the world of Facebook and the world of Google, you may think, okay, I've got this great idea for a clothing line or whatever, right? Or a, a hat. And you think, okay, I'm gonna, the design is perfect. People love it. Everyone I show it to, they love it. The biggest challenge out there right now is solving the Facebook and Google al- algorithms. If you're going to go to the B2C market, you have mm-hmm. to know how to solve that. And it seems simple. It's like, okay, I'm going to dump 300 bucks into Facebook and that's going to return $600. That's just not the way the math works. You have to become intimately tied into that. Well, it's funny because at dinner lately, we've started watching Shark Tank and Shark Tank reruns and my son loves it. And he he, he sits and calculates how much the, the valuation of each company is when they ask awesome. for their, you know, they ask for... Five, I'll give you, I'm asking for $1 million for 5%. Um, and so he's trying to figure those things out. But if you watch Shark Tank, all these all these sales problems and this customer acquisition stuff is debated and debated and debated. And if you have ideas, watch some episodes of Shark Tank and look at what investors are really saying. They will If, if the customer acquisition to sell a $10 product is more than a nickel, they don't want anything to do with that business, right? And so what is that customer acquisition for your business? Agreed. That's the first one is solving sales. The second one is being a details and a strategy person. I hear all the time people talk about, oh, I'm, I'm the vision guy. I'm, I'm the guy that understands the vision, especially if you're if this is a venture that you have a co-partner in that you're, you're going to hate that. And if you if you are somebody that wants to be an entrepreneur and all you are is the vision guy, it's going to be a tough it's going to be tough sledding for you. You don't necessarily even always need the best idea. What you need is the best execution. And if you're only dealing with vision people and not someone that can roll their sleeves up and get their hands dirty, it's going to be really be a really messy road for you. No doubt. And the other side's very painful too. If you are the detail guy and you get work done, and your other partner is just, oh, this is this is the way I see it. This is where we're going to get, but never does any of the work. That's yeah. going to be a problem as well. No doubt. Um, second is find a. a partner that complements your weaknesses and that can't be the whole strategy details thing but you you need some you need someone with technical chops if you have technical chops that's that's great too but you want somebody that you can deal with the good and the bad and i think bobby we've this is how we've worked best over the years together you used to be my manager at, at microsoft and i always felt like i know of course that you helped me um you help me get to the manager position and leadership position and, and coaching through all that. But I think what worked best about us is that we were always talking about what we were talking about. We've all had those managers and partners to where we're kind of having to talk around things. But with us, we've always been able to talk directly to each other about specifically what it is we want to accomplish. And we don't have to code it at all. And if, if, you, if you're looking to partner with someone in it, you should have that kind of relationship before you get involved Otherwise, you're going to have really difficult conversations early on that you're not going to know how to, how to manage. Yeah, one thing that I've always been fascinated with because I've not found someone else that I work as well with um, as you um, is, is really our ability to say, here's what we're going to try and do. And, and we're, we just wing the trying to do part of it. And this is where we want to be. And then the work just kind of just gets done. Like, And yeah. I've, I've never felt like... I've done 80% and you've done 20 or you're doing 80 and I'm doing 20. It's just like we've kind of just got to that end goal and broke some things and fixed some things and then solved some things, but it's it's just kind of worked. Um, and that's that's a, a very unique partnership, but if you can find that, stick with it. Agreed. The final one, Bobby, is that um, double what you expect to spend on the venture. Like – you have to be willing to put capital at risk. And that's why we talked about the upfront about kind of having the house in order before you jump into this. It's always going to take more time. It's always going to cost more money to get in the market. The forecast that you build in, in uh, and I can recall doing this uh, even recently, I can, I can think of these sexy Google finance uh, forecasts that I've put together saying, yeah, yeah, we can accomplish this. We can knock this out. It's always harder than you think. Mm -hmm. It's going to take more time. You're going to have to pick a point where you say, you know what, it's just not worth it anymore. Or I've got to cut bait on this campaign or I've got to get creative and come up with another approach or I need to take a deep breath and step back and and figure some more things out before we come back at it. Um, But it's always going to take more time than you expect. And that's why you've got to love, you've got to love what it is you're doing because it's the going will get tough, even if it's successful. The going will get tough. I can remember at, at Sparkhound, um, 
while we, we didn't hit the the top line goals that we wanted to right away in Dallas, we were profitable uh, very quickly in the in the Dallas office. And you you might think, well, that's means for celebration, right? Like that's means to like to go have a dinner or have a nice lunch and to smile about it. When you are in the trenches, it is very difficult to take a step back and appreciate what has been built and what you've done so far. Um, and those things will become exacerbated if you've not been successful, if you're not meeting those revenue goals and you are spending more money than you think. Well, you got to kind of want to be hard on yourself because if you're not, then you're going to you're gonna claim success way too early. So uh, if you get started and you think, oh, we're way ahead of the game, don't take your eye off the ball. It, it, something's going to break. Yeah, so let, let's jump into like – so you, you've got kind of your idea and you're trying to, um, you're in a position to where you're trying to keep your life in order. Bobby, I took some, this, it, we're going to kind of, we kind of were started strategic and then we're going to finish up here in the last eight minutes. More tactically speaking, it's like, how do you get your life in order so that you can start to jump into some of these ventures and, and take your step out, take a step out into it. Or maybe you don't want to get into a new venture. Maybe you just want to get your life in better order. Maybe, you know, there's, it's a little bit of chaos going around. So, Let's talk about that a little bit, Bobby. Um, first things first, um, just knowing what I'm knowing what I do every day. I've got uh, I've got several inboxes. I've got several calendars. I use Exchange Online. I've, I signed up for uh, Microsoft when it was called BPOS to uh, Office 365 to where now it's Exchange Online. It's actually been Exchange Online for a little bit, but I've got calendars. I am subscribed to Enterprise Email. For every venture that I'm in, of course, my workday stuff is in there, but also things like uh, TechSales Lab, TechSales Show, uh, Qualys, um, the rental homes, all of that stuff. I've got enterprise class email for it with a uh, with an inbox for it, with calendars. All those calendars are interconnected. I always know what's going on. I always know if Larry's going to be out at a rental home at 4 p.m. on Thursday, that is on the rental calendar. And it's actually really inexpensive to do this. It's only four dollars per mailbox. I think there's a minimum. I far exceeded that minimum, but it it's not no, too big not. of a number. It's, you can do just one now. You can, you can do, do just, just one mailbox. Yeah. There you go. So four dollars per mailbox, and then it's twelve dollars a month for a copy of Office, which again, like to have enterprise class, you know, email on your laptop uh, is incredibly valuable. And then as far as devices, I carry around an iPad Pro, uh, the, the one that has the keyboard attached. Of course, when I was traveling, this was way more valuable. We're in the COVID times as this episode is, is being recorded. So um, the so having, having the iPad Pro that I can carry around with me that's always connected to the internet, Bobby, if I, and then if I'm at lunch on a Tuesday in Austin, I can know, hey, this is going sideways. I need to jump in and, and solve this. How do you how do you carry around devices? You've got the flight school, you got Tech Sales Lab. How do you keep all that in order? Yep, I'm very similar. I have an iPad Pro, um, keyboard, pencil on it. I do. I would say it's probably close to fifty percent of my work on that. I do all this editing on that, so it's it truly is my secondary device, but it's mm-hmm. the primary floating device around my home that kind of gives me all working and personal worlds in one. So it's at my fingertips if I want to check the forecast, if I want to check the winds for a golf tournament. All that obviously is at my fingertips, and and then as it relates to work, I can definitely see my email, do my email, and all that stuff on there as well. I don't create a lot, so some of my graphic stuff, the the video editing for this and for the flight school, all that's done on uh, Adobe Premiere on my MacBook Pro. And then I have an Air, an old, older MacBook Air that, that I would call my personal computer that if I was going to get away from all the work for a while and just do some, some research or some learning, I would probably do it on that MacBook Air. Yeah. And it's about time to uh, refresh. Bobby, I've been checking out these uh, the new MacBooks lines coming out with the new ARM processor. So, um, of course, as I looked at efficiencies and all that kind of stuff, I, I am looking at these new devices coming down the road. And it's fun for me. Like somebody, I was talking to a good friend, and uh, he like has this old computer that's 10 years old, and he's he was kind of, you know, almost making fun of me for having and looking at the latest technology and all I could like Bobby all that was spinning through my head was 
why would you not want to have something that performs fast, that's efficient? Like, it makes me money. It literally makes me money. I, I, I cannot get myself to come to grips with something to where I'm, I'm waiting on a cut and paste function as tactical yeah. as that seems. I'm a gadget guy. So I'm always going to have the latest and greatest, but it does make it, it while the, the one spend is expensive. My last MacBook air lasted six years, right? So you say that's 70 months almost mm-hmm. of time, 72 months of time. What is, what's $3,000 spread across that, right? I mean, it's, you're down to like $2 a day. This thing's worth a lot more than $2 a day to me for sure um with all the whiz bang features and if you're looking i gotta say if they don't if they have an option without the touch bar get the touch bar i didn't think it was gonna make any sense but the touch bar is like it's changed the way i work on a computer yeah it's fantastic i've got it on my work computer and i'm about to buy a new personal computer that has it on there as well so the ipad's fantastic for like bombing out on a you know, a Saturday morning to get something done for Qualys um, or if I'm on the road in Austin for a workday trip and I just need to be able to quickly respond back to something. The iPad Pro is a game changer with the one with internet is a complete game changer in the keyboard. It performs almost like a real computer and it's slim and lightweight uh, as well. Uh, Trello is something I, I do bounce back and forth between to-do lists because I do burn out on to-do lists. So like once every year or two, I'll switch out and, and try another one um, because it's my day-to-day management of everything. So I've got general at-home items that are going on. It's basically the concept is you have boards that you use and you can organize your thoughts and your tasks and your goals based off these boards. It's a free tool. There's no cost to it. It has some great automation in it. But basically I have tasks organized and I have my Mac set up to where all I do is do a three-finger swipe right and I have that Trello board popped right up. So it's set up as a new window for me or a new desktop for me um, that I can jump in and, and focus on the things that are my priorities. Well, I don't know if you heard, but I stumbled upon this news. Microsoft is about to release a new tool called Lists, Microsoft Lists. And I think it's going to be game changing how well connected lists are going to be with SharePoint, Exchange, Task, Reminders, all that stuff. You might have a new to-do list to play with soon, Brian. Microsoft list looks very promising. I cannot wait. I like to change because I do I do burn out on it. And what ha- ends up happening always is I end up getting too many tasks on it. And there's got to be a purge process because I'll have a what I think is a good idea at 10 p.m. on a Thursday night. I'll add that to Trello. And then it, it those things build. And I never have the intention of getting them done. So there's this purge process I have to go through to make sure that I'm really focused on the most important things for the week. So I've got several boards here, Bobby. I've got you know my general at home stuff, work stuff, prayers, side projects, all that kind of stuff. I, I keep organized because in my email, I don't want to be working in my email all the time. I think it's a really inefficient way to get business done. I'm still at a zero inbox or near zero inbox. There will be a couple of stragglers that I'm that I'm actively working on, um, but the aim is to get to inbox zero and then do my strategic work out of Trello. Um, all right, so. Let's uh, let's wrap up here, Bobby, um, with just a few other tools that help us be more efficient. Google Sheets is a lifesaver for me. I have a nice list in my browser of the you know anywhere from a net worth calculator uh, that I've built over the past twenty years of the investments that I've got. Um, I, I use Google Sheets extensively. When I was traveling, I used uh, TripIt, and what's fantastic about TripIt is that it's free and you can forward your travel plans to it. And uh, my my wife, Autumn, can uh, have visibility. She also has this app and it syncs to her calendar and shows kind of what trip I'm on, what hotel I'm staying in, when my return flight is in case that she's trying to. So that way we don't have this kind of awkward back and forth about, hey, we have plans for this on Thursday. Are you gonna be back in time? She knows exactly what flight I'm gonna be on uh, and what time I'll return home. I miss. I slightly miss those days, Bobby. They're, they're, mm-hmm. The travel is not really happening right now, but uh, that's a fantastic app. Uh, OneNote is something we're in actively right now as we record this episode. Um, I have probably ten OneNote. OneNote. Um, uh, what do you call them? Notebooks. Folders. Yeah, <laughs> notebooks. <laughs> and um, I use those for um, for my time in London. I had one uh, from you know, shopping for homes, I have one. For contractors that I use, I have one. Um, I, I keep my life organized 
for kind of the long-term archiving needs, I keep all that in, uh, in OneNote. And if you commit to that, that, I mean, that never goes away, right? So I've been using OneNote since really it came out. I have meeting notes from when I met with customers in the Microsoft days. Everything I ever did at Sparkhound, I kind of created a fiscal year notebook that I kind of kept up with for every every year at Sparkhound, every year at EMC, every year at Dell. I mean, I have all those notes that are searchable. And you don't have to have them all sunk, so they're all in the cloud now, and I can get back to them anytime I want to. So it's a great tool. Agreed. Uh, we talked about the browser. I use the the new Microsoft Edge browser. is fantastic. You have you can do what's called collections, which are great. So if you're working on a side project and you want to, um, you know, you've got a list of like ten links. You could of course set up a shortcut folder, but the collections are outstanding in Edge. Uh, Microsoft's done a great job getting back in the browser game. Uh, Bobby, a, a little known one, but one I use all the time is called Capto. So there will be times for the teams that I'm managing to where I want to show them how to do something real quick. Like, hey, I need you to take care of this activity in Salesforce. Here's a quick 30-second video on how to do it. I can record myself doing it and then send it out to the team over email. And it's super, super easy. It's called Capto, C-A-P-T-O. Interesting. I've been using a product called Loom lately, which is very similar. It's cloud-based screen recording. Okay, nice, nice. And then I I think the biggest hack for me... um, and we'll wrap up on this, Bobby, is sleeping a ton. I uh, Even with all these things going on, I, last night I was in bed at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, I watched one episode of Ozark um, and then and then was asleep by 9 o'clock, 9.15, because um, it's crucial Like with all these things going on. I need to be able to pop up out of bed at 5.45 uh, with my coffee uh, ready to go. Um, I don't waste time on sitting on the couch. Um, I don't play video games. I don't play with my phone. Maybe I'm missing out, Bobby, but I, I doubt it. I don't. I don't enjoy those types of things. Those things don't give me energy. Well, I'm jealous because I just started watching Yellowstone, and I, I, I can't just watch one episode. That show's pretty damn good. Um, it, it rivals Ozark. It's a really good show. But I, other than that, that's my one weakness lately: is these binge watching shows that uh, are on Netflix and 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 of the sort. And Yellowstone's been one that I've been wanting to watch and it's been pretty damn good but i would say we've talked about it a lot um removing the badges getting rid of candy crush the games on the phone all that has made me a much more productive person and given me a lot of time back that i think uh unfortunately we we see way too many people wasting out there in the work world today with that bobby don't be average average sucks average is the enemy If you've got any questions on this or anything else, please reach out to us. We love doing the listeners' choices. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Tech Sales Show. Subscribe to our email list at www.techsaleshow.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Tech Sales Show. Until next week, average is the enemy.